Good evening and welcome back to another episode of The Longing, where today we are going to be continuing to read Homer's Iliad. So let's get going. Thus fell two heroes, one the pride of Thrace, and one the leader of the Epian race. Death's sable shade at once o'ercast their eyes, in dust the vanquished and the victor lies. With copious slaughter all the fields are red, and heaped with growing mountains of the dead. Had some brave chief this martial scene beheld, by Pallas guarded through the dreadful field. Might darts be bid to turn their points away, and swords around him innocently play. The war's whole art with wonder had he seen, and counted heroes where he counted men. So fought each host with thirst of glory fired, and crowds on crowds triumphantly expired. Map of the Plain of Troy Book 5. Argument. The Acts of Diomed Diomed, assisted by Pallas, performs wonders in this day's battle. Pandarus wounds him with an arrow, but the goddess cures him, enables him to discern gods from mortals, and prohibits him from contending with any of the former, excepting Venus. Cnaeus joins Pandarus to oppose him. Pandarus is killed, and Cnaeus is in great danger, but for the assistance of Venus who, as she is removing her son from the fight, is wounded on the hand by Diomed. Apollo seconds her in his rescue, and at length carries off Cnaeus to Troy, where he is healed in the temple of Pergamus. Mars rallies the Trojans and assists Hector to make a stand. In the meantime, Cnaeus is restored to the field, and they overthrow several of the Greeks, among the rest Tlepa, Tlepolemus is slain by Sarpedon. Juno and Minerva descend to resist Mars. The latter incites Diomed to go against that god. He wounds him and sends him groaning to heaven. The first battle continues through this book. The scene is the same as in the former. But Pallas now Tydides' soul inspires, 143 fills with her force, and warms with all her fires. Above the Greeks his deathless fame to raise, and crown her hero with distinguished praise. High on his helm celestial lightnings play, his beamy shield emits a living ray. The unwearied blaze incessant stream supplies, like the red star that fires the autumnal skies. When fresh he rears his radiant orb to sight, and bathed in ocean shoots a keener light. Such glories Pallas on the chief bestowed, such from his arms the fierce efful effulgence flowed. Onward she drives him furious to engage, where the fight burns and where the thickest rage. The sons of dares first the combat sought, a wealthy priest but rich without a fault. In Vulcan Vulcan's fane the father's days were led, the sons of toils of glorious battle bred. These singled from their troops the fight maintain, these from their steeds Tydides on the plain. Fierce for renown the brother chiefs draw near, and first bold Phegeus cast his sounding spear, which o'er the warrior's shoulder took its course, and spent in empty air its erring force. Not so, Tydides flew thy lance in vain, but pierced his breast and stretched him on the plain. Seized with unusual fear, Idaeus fled, left the rich chariot and his brother dead. And had not Vulcan lent celestial aid, he too had shrunk to death's eternal shade. But in a smoky cloud the god of fire preserved the sun. Fire, uh, sorry. But in a smoky cloud the god of fire preserved the sun in pity to, to the sire. The steeds and chariot to the navy led, increased the spoils of gallant Diomed. Struck with amaze and shame the Trojan crew, or slain or fled the sons of Dare's view. When by the blood-stained hand Minerva pressed, the god of battles and this speech addressed. 
stern power of war by whom the mighty fall, who bathe in blood and shake the lofty wall. Let the brave chiefs their glorious toils divide, and whose the conquest mighty Jove decide. While we from interdicted fields retire, nor tempt the wrath of heaven's avenging sire. Her words allay the impetuous warrior's heat, the god of arms and martial made retreat. Removed from fight on Xanthus's flowery bounds, they sat and listened to the dying sounds. Meantime the Greeks the Trojan race pursue, and some bold chieftain every leader slew. First Odius falls and bites the bloody sand, his death ennobled by Atrides' hand. As he f as he to flight his wheeling car addressed, the speedy javelin drove from back to breast. In dust the mighty Halizonian lay. His arms resound, the spirit's wings, the spirit wings its way. Thy fate was next, O Phaestus, doomed to feel the great Idomeneus's protect protended steel, whom Borus sent his son and only joy, from fruitful Tarne to the fields of Troy. The Cretan javelin reached him from afar, and pierced his shoulder as he mounts his car. Back from the car he tumbles to the ground, and everlasting shades his eyes surround. Then died Scamand Scamandrius, expert in the chase, in woods and wilds to wound the savage race. Diana taught him all her sylvan arts, to bend the bow and aim unerring darts. But vainly here Diana's arts he tries, the fatal lance arrests him as he flies. From Menelaus's arm the weapon sent, through his broad back and heaving bosom went. Down sinks the warrior with a thundering sound, his brazen armour rings against the ground. Next artful Phericlus untimely fell, bold Merion sent him to the realms of hell. Thy father's skill, O Phericlus, was thine, the graceful fabric and the fair design. For loved by Pallas, Pallas did impart to, to him the shipwrights and the builder's art. Beneath his hand the fleet of Paris rose, the fatal cause of all his country's woes. But he the mystic will of heaven unknown, nor saw his country's peril, nor his own. The hapless art artist, while confused, he fled. The spear of Merion mingled with the dead. Through his right hip, with forceful fury cast, between the bladder and the bone it passed. Prone on his knees he falls with fruitless cries, and death in lasting slumber seals his eyes. From Megaes's force the swift Pedius, Pideus fled, Antenor's offspring from a foreign bed, whose generous spouse, Theonor, heavenly fair, nursed the young stranger with a mother's care. How vain those cares when Meg Megaes in the rear, full in his nape, infixed the fatal spear. Swift through his crackling jaws the weapon glides, and the cold tongue and grinning teeth divides. Then died Hypsenor, generous and divine, sprung from the brave Delopian, Delopian's mighty line. Who near adored Scamander made abode, priest of the stream and honoured as a god. On him amidst the flying numbers found, Eurypylus inflicts a deadly wound. On his broad shoulders fell the forceful brand, thence glancing downwards lopped his holy hand, which stained with sacred blood the blushing sand. Down sunk the priest, the purple hand of death, closed his dim eye and fate suppressed his breath. Thus toiled the chiefs in different parts engaged, in every quarter fierce Tydides raged. Amid the Greek, amid the Trojan train, Wrapped through the ranks, he thunders o'er the plain. Now here, now there, he darts from place to place, Pours on the rear or lightens in their face. Thus from high hills the torrent swift and strong, 
deluge whole fields and sweep the trees along. Through ruined moles the rushing wave resounds, o'erwhelms the bridge and bursts the lofty bounds. The yellow harvests of the ripened year and flattened vineyards one sad waste appear. 144. While Jove descends in sluicy sheets of rain, and all the labours of mankind are vain. And so we come to the end of the episode. Not the end of the chapter, but just the end of the episode. So I will say thank you very much for joining me today. I hope you all have a wonderful morning, evening, afternoon or night, no matter what time of day it is. I hope you all have a wonderful one of it. And as always, we will be back tomorrow for more of The Longing. Goodbye.